Welcome, and thank you for joining us for Where We're Going. This series from Think ND explores this point in time and how the work happening through Notre Dame's campus relates to and impacts the United States and the world at large. I'm Dolly Duffy, the Executive Director of the Notre Dame Alumni Association. And I ask you for a moment of silence today as we remember two first year students from Notre Dame who were tragically killed this weekend, Olivia Laura Rojas and Valeria Espinal. Please pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. Over the past two weeks, we've talked to campus and national experts about sports, work happening here at Notre Dame on diversity and performance and stadium design, and professional and college administrators who share their leadership philosophies and how they have led through the current pandemic. Today, our focus turns international and how athletes, coaches, and fans around the world are responding and adapting to the coronavirus and preparing the next generation of outstanding athletes. But before we get started, please remember, if you have questions for our guest speakers, please use the Google form that we're sharing with you now. We will attempt to answer as many of the questions that you submit as we can. To start today's discussion and welcome our guest, I'd first like to introduce our moderator from the Mendoza College of Business, Chris Stevens. Chris played basketball here at Notre Dame under Digger Phelps. I like to sometimes think that Digger Phelps worked for Chris. Chris graduated in 1974 and before returning to campus in his faculty role, he was one of the three original founders of Keurig. Chris has been an incredible partner to the Alumni Association and so many others across campus here at Notre Dame. Chris, you teach a sports management class that pairs our undergraduates with organizations across the country on a variety of projects. So I'm curious, just to start us off, have any of the students this semester or recently worked with global organizations or on global trends? You know, Dolly, not yet, which is one of the reasons why I'm so excited about today's panel. Uh, and I know my students are as well. So here at Notre Dame, uh, we're exploring creating a sports management minor. Sports plays such a critical role in the world, in our country, communities, our schools, and especially here at Notre Dame. So across campus, we are offering several courses, including ethics and sports, uh, sports and the law. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of courses, uh, sports marketing. Uh, the course that I designed is called Sports Management Experiential Learning. And it's offered to those students across all colleges that dream of having a career in some area of sports management. And the career options are endless. Coaching, general management, sports agency, marketing, facilities management, league management, professional, college, high school, youth, and international options are plentiful, which leads us to today's discussion. So when the pandemic started to spread, different countries handled it in vastly different ways. From total lockdowns in places like China to virtually no formal preventative actions in countries like Sweden. So some countries were quick to respond decisively while others took less a less cautious approach. But with the worldwide positive cases approaching 45 million people and winter season closing in, some countries are looking at an ominous second wave or even third wave of infections. The impact on the international sports world has been dramatic. The Olympic games were postponed. Soccer leagues went dark and finally reopened to fanless stadiums. Moreover, international competitors in sports such as basketball were canceled at all levels. The impact on societies around the globe has been and continues to be significant. So we are thrilled to have three guests today who will be able to offer their perspectives. So our distinguished panel will seek to address these issues over the course of the next 50 minutes. And we're grateful that you've either returned for a third helping of where we're going in sports, or if you've just joined us for the first time. Um, let's meet our panel. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go deeply into their impressive bios, as you can see them on ThinkND, and some of you have already received emails with them. Today, to discuss these topics, though, we're joined by, first, welcome to Carol Callan, who is not only the Women's National Team USA Director of Basketball, she was elected last year to be president of FIBA Americas, the Federation of International Basketball of Americas. And she's learning different languages too, so she can communicate and lead those meetings. Carol was the primary architect of the newly created USA national team program with a women posting, get this, 
an incredible 112 and one record in international competition since 1996, including six straight gold medals. I think the last time they, they lost was during the Truman administration. Danielle Medina is chief of athlete care and performance for Monumental Sports. Um, Monumental Sports owns, among other teams, the WNBA Mystics that were the defending champs last year, as well as the NBA Washington Wizards. He joined Monumental after two years in a similar capacity with the Philadelphia 76ers. Prior to the 76ers, Danielle spent more than a decade with one of the premier soccer teams in the world, Football Club Barcelona, including being team physician and deputy director of sports science and medicine, overseeing the wellness efforts for more than 2,000 players and 125 staff members. Hola, Danielle. Good to have you with us. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Sitafa Savani is currently sports commentator for Movistar Plus, the largest subscription television provider in Spain with more than 3.8 million customers. After attending the U.S. Naval Academy where he played basketball, he played professionally in Spain for 15 seasons and was a member of the Senegal national basketball team. Sitafa, welcome to the panel. Good to have you with us. Thank you. Great to be here. So let's start maybe our questions. Uh, Carol, let me start with you. The Summer Olympics were supposed to be in Tokyo just a couple of months ago, but due to COVID, they were postponed and delayed until 2021. How have your players and coaches handled this horrible development? Well, thanks, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me as well. I, you know, it's it's a tough time. Uh, interestingly, uh, I'll use Sue Bird as an example. She's a four-time Olympian, hoping to be a five-time Olympian, just turned 40 years old. Uh, so a, a one-year delay for her, uh, she's had four opportunities. So I think she's very um, aware of, of what the situation is. Uh, she's learned to take care of her body. I think anyone that's, as they age as an athlete, they do a better job nutritionally and how they train. She said to me, you know, as long as people continue to play basketball in some form or fashion, we'll be okay next summer. And so I think that's, that's on her mind. I also think of other players that were on the cusp of being a first-time Olympian and how disappointed they were that maybe now a year later, you know, we hadn't picked our team yet, but now a year later, are they still in contention like they thought they were? So I, I do think it's, it's a tough situation for players mentally, but I think they've had a chance to move on. The WNBA had a season this summer. The European teams are now getting back playing again, uh, even though the, the, the cases are spiking worldwide. But uh, we're hearing from Tokyo, the organizing committee and the IOC, that we're going to have an Olympics, re whether there's a vaccine or not. And everybody is working very hard to make sure the players are protected. Uh, the players continue to train. I think they've navigated it pretty well. There's still uncertainty, which is uh, uncomfortable for all of us. But FIBA is beginning competitions again. They had pretty much shut down over the summer. End of November are qualifying tournaments for zone championships. And so we're all sort of stepping in, maybe the deep end of the pool right away, but we are trying to get back to uh, what is the new normal in terms of taking care of the safety of the athletes, but getting back on the court. Well, you obviously the WNBA had real success in terms of being able to operate kind of in their bubble. And Danielle, I know the Wizards were one of 22 teams invited to the NBA bubble at Disney World. Maybe can you share with us your thoughts about that experience and how the NBA handled the restart? And do you see any long-term potential affects on the players after being isolated so long? Yeah, it, it actually, <clears throat> actually it seems like far away now, but, uh, but I tell you, the, the opportunity that uh, NBA uh, gave us creating the bubble, um, the feeling that we had, it was kind of a, of a lucky privilege to be able to go back to our normal activity in a moment where pretty much across the world everything was paralyzed as just just returning to activity so i think we all went in with a with a feeling of getting into once in a life experience as it was and i i truly believe it, it will be and um and sort of a feeling a little bit of part of an epidemiological experiment right like uh, like getting everyone together with all the testing and creating a safe environment and um, and actually, I you know I believe 
that um, that MBA, you know, in a way proved that um, <clears throat> that following science, excuse me, <clears throat> and allocating allocating resources in an adequate way can really tackle many of the situations that we have on top of the use of technology and how all this uh, development on health and safety policies turn out to be the way to create a league that actually was able to finish the season, the regular season and go through uh, the playoff with, without any, any major issues, right? So I would say, I would describe it as um, uh, using uh, one of our players, Mo Wagner, he described the bubble as a basketball paradise for him. Got to acknowledge that for the Wizards, particularly our chances of making the finals or even the playoffs were pretty low. So we knew that we were going to be there for like six, seven weeks. So that's, that, that mentally uh, was a different uh, setup for us. But in my, my personal view, I felt like a basketball monk in a way, right? With a really good routine and, um, and a kind of a greyhound day where you pretty much get up, do your breakfast, go to practice, go back. So it was, it was good for a limited time. Regarding how NBA handled the situation, like I said, I think it was outstanding job done by the NBA, led by the commissioner, Adam Silver. Definitely great job done by the medical uh, of the league, David Wise, Dr. DeFiori, Dr. Uh, Sims. I think they gave a true lesson in management and leadership uh, starting. And now if we go back to March when they decided to shut down the league, in that context, there was no restriction in gatherings whatsoever. There was nothing in place, really. And the decision that the league made, it kind of created this domino effect that uh, dictated what the sports did after that. Um, their communication, their implication and facilitation and, uh, on studies that ended up uh, even designing a test that is uh, cheap and available to everyone, a saliva test with the NBA. I think they're, they're an example of, of leadership. And regarding the players, I think, you know, like our experience was short, as I said, but it, you know, being in the bubble drives mental and physical exhaustion, I tell you. Uh, we all know how important families are for our lives in general. Uh, you get, you get pulled pull away from your family. Uh, you're with your group of people, your little family in the bubble, but we, we you know, I think that's, that's really taxing. And, um, you know, players are viewed as uh, privileged people with access to testing in the bubble, salaries, etc. But we all know that, you know, under the skin, they're just normal people, normal young people that they suffer and they have the same uh, fear for the future personally and their health and their families like we all do. So I think the experience in the bubble was super positive, but really taxing mentally and, and physically for, for everyone. Uh, thanks, Danielle. And I would like to note that the executive vice president who was responsible for coordinating everything relative to the bubble and the scheduling and everything was Byron Sproul, a Notre Dame graduate. Good, to, Byron, great job. Yep. Hey, uh, Sitafa, uh, I know that you're in Spain uh, right now, and, and that's where you do your broadcasting, and you're getting your executive uh, NBA there. You know, Spain looked like that they had the same lick back in July, and then of late, there's really been quite a spike uh, uh, in terms of a second wave. And how are the sports teams in Spain and other team places in Europe, Germany, Italy, some of those other places in Belgium that are spiking hard again? Are they, are they doing lockdowns or what? Well, um, obviously in, uh, in Europe, you have different factors at work at the same time. The USA is one country. Here in Europe, you have a set of different countries that form the European Union. So the regulation is one within your country. Then you also have the one at the European level. This affects all professional sports teams, especially the higher level ones, which play within their national leagues. And in many cases, also in European leagues. Therefore, it's not just about what uh, restrictions may happen in your own country, but the ones that happen in other countries. For instance, just yesterday in France and Germany, uh, President Macron and Frau Merkel announced that they were going basically on, on shutdown mode. So this morning, the first question everywhere was, how does this affect the EuroLeague basketball? How does it affect the Champions League in football? If one country decides that sports, professional sports has to stop, how does those league, how do those leagues uh, go on. So quite a lot of uncertainty in, uh, in all the different uh, spaces. Back in, uh, in the springtime, as, as you mentioned, when the first wave came about, um, and as Daniel also mentioned, after the decision by the NBA to stop, I think it almost freed everybody else to be able to take such a harsh and big decision at the time and also stop. Here in Spain, we later actually had the first bubble uh, that the NBA was actually connected to, to kind of, you know, take some of the lessons 
learn from that. It, it worked out very well and allowed the league to finish its season. But now starting up again with the second wave coming up, as you mentioned, we're back to a situation, honestly, of a lot of doubts. Games are already being post- postponed because now it's not a bubble situation. You cannot have teams, as Daniel mentioned, in a bubble for eight, nine, ten months. So players actually living their normal lives, getting tested thoroughly between games. But at the end of the day, when you're not in a bubble, there are infections, there are teams getting uh, getting confined and a lot of games getting pushed back. So it's really being a fight week by week to keep this going, not being very clear or certain that we'll be able to complete this season. Well, I tell you, for all three of you, you know, you've, I, I think one of the major challenges that, that is athletes face is uh, in this new age, I mean, the new NBA season is going to start up here pretty soon. And Danielle, maybe you can offer some perspective in terms of when that's going to be. But from a conditioning standpoint, you know, Carol, your, your, your league doesn't really start up in, for another six or seven months or so. Um, and then, you know, uh, Sitafa, the, you, you, as you're talking about training and everything is so much different. So how, how do you go about, do you have specific new types of training programs to try to help athletes stay in shape? Carol, how about you first? That's interesting. Uh, We're set up just a little bit differently in basketball um, because our players are truly professional athletes. So I'll use the women as the example. The men are somewhat similar to this. The women play in the summer in the WNBA and to truly maximize their financial value, they then go overseas during the traditional winter season. So our biggest problem for our national team is finding a time to train our national team. Our players play all the time. They play during the summer. They play during the winter. Now, as they get older, they get a little tired of that international piece, even though, you know, those club teams in Europe are really, really good to our players. They pay them a lot of money. But the players that then have decided, okay, I can't, my body can't handle year round play. They now will take the winter off or famously a couple of them have actually taken the summer off, but they have enough resources now that they have their sort of personal trainers, not quite to the degree that perhaps some of the men's players do, uh, but they've, they've determined how to do that. Our pipeline at USA Basketball is starting at the very young ages, players play, uh, the school-based programming in the United States is why we're so good. You know, kids play in middle school on club teams, they play in high school, they play in college, and then they go to the pros. Our programming is complementary to that. So when we have a U16, U17 team, we dip over and we pull a high school kid into our program for just a short period of time during the summer, and then they go back to high school. Same thing for our collegiate age, same thing for our uh, World Cup and Olympic Games level. We're borrowing players to come play for us. Now, the beauty of it is our players are the continuity of our program. Coaches come and go, but players are the, you know, we want them to play again and again and again. That's why we're successful. You know, I mentioned Sue Bird wants to be a five-time Olympian. Diana Trossi wants to be a five-time Olympian. Our head coach, Don Staley, was a three-time Olympian. Then she was a two-time assistant coach. Now she's a head coach. And the other critical piece to our success, other than being a great basketball player, is the culture that has been uh, reinforced year after year after year, and it's owned by the athletes. Don Staley and those other multiple time Olympians, you have to pry our culture away from them because they are the ones that reinforce it yearly, daily, and and they live it. And that's why we're successful. Got it. So Danielle, in terms of off season conditioning, the NBA league just, you know, wrapped up and certain teams had a lot more time off than others did, but are you doing anything special as, as a head of fitness and, and uh, nutrition for the team? Anything special, different in, in a COVID world? Uh, I would say the, and, and following what Carol was saying, you know, for our WNBA is, is pretty much going on that track. We have players playing in Europe, uh, some of them taking care of uh, chronic conditions that they have in this offseason to get ready, hopefully for the next season. 
on the MBA side, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we came out of the bubble uh, pretty soon. So our players have had an um, off season since the first week of August, I would say. So they've been lucky enough to have some downtime uh, with their family uh, for, for some time, some of them in Europe, uh, across the States, and pretty much uh, is becoming, I would say, some, some sort of a normal postseason for NBA players as most of them and you know this postseason time is really regulated by the league in terms of relationship with the teams and everything. Most of the players um, in our case, and, and I think across the league more and more, they understand how important the, this ramp up period is for the season, particularly in this period of time where um, uh, like it happened in the bubble, we're gonna, we still don't have a clear calendar and the ramp up might happen just uh, as it's been uh, acknowledged in media as soon as you know, a month from now, we might be in training camp. So the three, three to six weeks leading into training camp, more and more, I think players are acknowledging the, how important that is. So they, they all get, a, get advice on what to do uh, through the teams. Normally, some coordination with their, uh, with their own. Most of them have people around their agencies or, or private people that they train uh, with. Uh, we try to make sure that Obviously, they, their, their setup is, is safe in terms of, uh, of COVID, which is, you know, it's common trace. And I think one of the biggest learnings of the bubble is the, the whole piece of education that NBA did with the players and all of us. So, so I, I think they're, they're pretty much well equipped to go out there. So they're just doing basketball, as Carol's, Carol's mentioned. For a basketball player, the most important thing is to play basketball and to touch the ball as much as you can, go through the specificity of the moves, and, um, and being on court and, um, and get that baseline that by the time we get them back here, both from a fitness and a body composition perspective, they're, they're good enough to, to do a quick and, and safe ramp up. So that's where we are right now. Uh, we're lucky to have a pretty young roster, uh, the guys that are really uh, good connectors and you know, they, they feedback a weekly basis and we, we, we have a chance to follow up with them. So, so in that sense, it's been a good uh, and positive postseason for all of us. So, Sitafa, um, I, I recall back in my playing days in Belgium when I had a chance to play there, basketball there was structured in Belgium based on clubs. And there might be a sponsor of the club or the members own the club. It's different than the United States where we're really scholastic base. Uh, players play for their junior high school, their high school, college, et cetera. Can you maybe shed a little bit more light about the differences between you've had a chance to play in three different continents in terms of the structure of sports and the different areas where you played? Yeah, as you mentioned uh, already, you know, the, the structure in the, in the U.S., in Europe and in Africa is, uh, is different, where the, the small clubs and associations are truly the, the bedrock of uh, amateur sports. And in most cases, it's actually connected to the professional teams. So in the States, you have the NBA who doesn't have, let's say, its youth themes. You know, the Washington Wizards don't have their directly linked Washington Wizards themes at all the different youth level. In Barcelona, for example, where Danielle was, it is the case. So everything that has happened that affects the amateur side and the professional side both impacts the, the club on this end. So it's really the double the, the issues that they, that they have to deal with. Even at the professional level, when we talk about basketball, for example, over here, uh, the the same amount of resources are not available. So here back in March, when we went into shutdown, you have the majority of professional basketball players that live in an apartment. So you are obviously a lot more limited than LeBron James in his huge mansion with a basketball court probably outside that can continue, as Danielle said, playing basketball, which is the training that you need as a basketball player. And I know many players that lived in you know a quite small apartment and had to literally be there for three months and then get out because of the schedule limitations, didn't have, I believe it was about four weeks ramp up to get to actually play to the bubble that was set up by the league over here. So the biggest concern was actually on the injury side, obviously. It almost trumped the part about the COVID because that part was very well controlled. They did a great job on that end, but it was the first time for most of these players that they had been for so long without playing basketball. I mean, since probably there were little kids under 10, they had never gone three months without playing basketball. Uh, so they really did a great job at all different levels from the, the medical staffs, you know, the trainers and whatnot to be able to get them right. And frankly, it was a true success. There was no COVID uh, cases during the bubble. 
and injuries were not at any higher uh, level than during prior seasons. Well, wow. okay. So, hey, Carol, I'm, I'm kind of curious in your perspective about the Olympic trials based on your, your capacity as president of the FIBAs. Um, how are other countries maybe preparing for the Olympics or, or, or preparing for things? Do you see any differences in terms of how different countries are preparing? And do you see anybody who maybe is doing something that a lot of other people are going to emulate? Well, I think, you know, if you're uh, if you're in business, you're always wondering what your competitors are doing right. and, and either stealing or, uh, or blocking. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. FIBA Americas is, uh, uh, is, a, is an interesting zone. You have the haves a little bit and the have nots. So you have, you know, the North American zone, sub zone is USA and Canada and resources are are pretty good in those two countries. You go all the way down into the South American subzone, and you have Brazil and Argentina that classically are, are very good in basketball. Um, and, and then you have in the middle, you have the Caribbean Central American zone where you have a lot of island nations that are pretty small. So everybody is trying to figure out in this uh, COVID era where the finances are coming from. Right. And so the, the South Americans have, there is a BCLA. Uh, Tafa mentioned the Basketball Champions League in Europe. The Americas has one too. And two nights ago, that started back playing a semifinal game that had been on hold since last March. Friday, tomorrow night will be the final game. I mentioned the uh, qualifying games that will be going on for all of the zones. The America Cup qualifiers will be the end of, of, um, of November where there will be bubble approaches. South America is gonna have a bubble in Argentina and teams will start to be playing. And interestingly enough, FIBA Americas, we've been hearing from a lot of our, our federations that they would like to link with another federation in the Americas that maybe they could learn from each other. And so we're gonna try and start something that uh, we're kicking around the idea of calling it FIBA Networks. Uh, but the idea also perhaps that in the United States, because we have not only uh, a, a very, very good federation program that we have going, but we have so many good college programs that perhaps we can start linking federations to college programs to learn from each other. Um, you know, I, I think that the United States college system really benefits from international athletes. And is there some way to make that uh, recruitment, enlistment, not only for college athletes, but even, even college students a little bit better within the Americas? And so we're, we're always looking at what other groups do that makes sense um, competitively, but also just building up all of the federations that we have. And so I don't know that I could say, okay, this country does it better because I think every country has, has bobbed and weaved within their own country to come up with the best way that they do it. But when we do get together, we always ask, well, how are you treating this? What are you doing to, uh, to become better? And so while we wanna look at the, the federations that need the most help sort of in getting off the ground, and by the way, 3X3 is a great way to do that with smaller federations. We also wanna be able to make sure that in the Americas, we continue to, to play well in worldwide competitions. The United States does well, Argentina, uh, was runner up to Spain in the most recent World Cup on the men's side. So we're always looking not only to compete with each other, but to build each other up. Got it. So Daniel, let me just kind of flip to you there in terms of the NBA season. I think a lot of people are trying to anticipate whether when the, the new NBA season is going to start. And uh, I think uh, Raul Fernandez said that they would love to be able to get it going by the, the Christmas day, which has always been a great day for NBA and any thoughts, any insights in terms of when you think the NBA might start up again? 
honest, honestly, I, can, I cannot uh, tell you more than what is uh, it uh, is publicly known, uh, basically because I do not have any any any. Come on, I'm looking for some insider trading here. But, <laughs> but I definitely can tell you, like uh, I would, I would love to start in in December 25th. Yeah. Um, I think will be will be good for 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 all of us. And uh, as uh, Sitapa mentioned briefly. On, on the mental health side and Carol also on the importance of having basketball, right? For, for our players and like, like everyone, but uh, you know, at times when you see how uh, this whole league's approach are, are, are taken, it seems to be forgotten in the media, right? Like our guys, they're, you know, they're lost without their routine. They're lost about, without basketball. The lockout was terrible in, a, in, in sense of uh, mental health for, for the population in general, but uh, but also for our, for our guys that are basically to have this, uh, they're used to have their basketball, their contact with the team, and um, and their daily routine. I think the sooner we get started, the better for for many many reasons, uh, but mainly for them physically and and mentally. I know it's going to be a little bit taxing for those that uh, left the bubble uh, and after playing the finals, which is a quite short post season. But I think those, you know, those uh, performance teams and medical teams will be able to handle that situation uh, probably better than long, long postseason, like you know, like we might might have. So if you know, answer your question, if if I was uh, to choose, I would rather have a short postseason and get back into our basketball again. The sooner, the better. Um, understanding that that we need to do it safely and we need some some space for a quite nice four six weeks ramp up. Um, but again, NBA has all the credit. I think they deserved it after the uh, the design they did for for the bubble. They allowed nice ramp up, safe, safely done from an injury perspective. It, um, I think the bubble. One of the um, uh, issues with the bubble is that we're going to get a lot of data, not only on testing and COVID and interaction of the population of over a thousand people that were there at some point. But also in terms of injuries, it's just from an eye perspective, it doesn't seem like we got in much um, higher rates. So it's um, it's a great achievement from uh, everyone across the league. In our case, it was exactly that we had a we had a, a an intense season, I would say, uh, injury wise, until we got into the bubble that we just navigated perfectly. So so yeah, really looking forward to to have all the guys back and start working on on yeah. on the next season. Just as a reminder, everybody, there's a Google form there. If you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to submit them. Uh, Satafa, you know, youth sports have been dramatically impacted here in the States. What's it like in Spain and, and any place else that you know of? Well, the, the impact has been, uh, has been similar. And keep in mind here, schools were shut down back in the, back in the spring. So this meant for all that youth uh, time at home. And again, as I mentioned prior, living quarters in general, are much smaller in uh, in Spain, and for long periods of time, people weren't even allowed, for example, in uh, here in Spain, to go out and be able to to use the public parks and uh, and whatnot. So this was a huge impact and a huge challenge for those youth players because unlike professionals, again, they don't have access to the same level of uh, of resources. So they really had to, you know, use to use a lot of innovation. Let's call it or these alternative methods everything that was online based to be able to on their own uh, do a certain type of training. Teams also use obviously the, the, the virtual tools available to maintain that contact with their, with their players. But as we know, especially when we talk about much younger players, it's not the same as professional. Maintaining that discipline, that, that motivation during such uncertain times was very hard. But I think in general, they did a great job of putting the focus on the fact that this is not just sports from the performance level that we're used to looking at it, but also from the health level. Yeah. Because obviously when we talk about COVID, we speak a lot of times about prevention from the outside, but as an ex uh, uh, big man in basketball, I always mention inside defense is key to any team's uh, success, which means our, our own immune system, the strength of our own bodies. So there was a lot of focus on that side to, to, to motivate uh, youth to really keep up with that activity. So, you know, Carol, I was really I was curious about something, you know, following up on Sutapa's comments. Uh, your pro Team USA women's accomplishments are well-documented, incredible. But you also have incredible accomplishments with the U-17 teams, U-19 teams, the, the, the girls' teams. And I understand that you now have a training program 
that is kind of virtual to help them still develop their skills and they don't even need a basketball? <laughs> well, yes. Uh, so we have a youth division. Uh, we have a national teams division that, that selects the teams, trains them, goes to international events. We also then have a youth division that sort of filled a need at that grassroots level um, that isn't maybe so elite athlete focused, but just in general, how do you get more kids interested in playing basketball? Uh, and how do you make it the transition from where they're just playing fun games, probably just playing with a ball to then playing on teams. And we find that about eighth grade is when players, uh, especially girls say, you know, it's no longer fun anymore. And some of that I think is, uh, personally, I was a math teacher in my former life and in high school. And what happens when a kid doesn't get math? Because sometimes it's like chemistry for me, I didn't understand it. So I was just like, this is dumb. So, you know, as a math teacher, you're trying to make it easy for a kid to understand math. Otherwise they go, this is stupid. Well, with basketball, it's a little bit the same way. You know, if you're not as good as somebody, pretty soon you drop out because you just don't think you can hang with them. And so our youth division does camps they, of course, pre-COVID were done in person where they would go around the country and, and have these camps. Well, with COVID, how do you do that? And, and they came up with these virtual camps where we have some of our elite coaches that send them through workouts that are at different levels. You know, it, it can be, how do you get yourself in shape? What are the things you need to be able to do? Unfortunately, around our country, PE at the elementary school levels has become less important. Uh, not certainly to the PE teachers and the coaches, but kids don't know how to, how to just do basic movements. So sometimes we start, we break it down all the way to the beginning and start with uh, very basic movements and, and conditioning and then get a ball. Uh, a lot of, of national governing bodies in the U.S. have an athlete development model, ADMs for, for short, and it is to try and get kids to just do that basic movement. What's interesting about our virtual camps, from what I'm hearing, we have kind of a beginner level and something we call the advanced camp, and much like <laughs> I'm sure uh, people find in school, everybody sort of thinks they're the advanced camp. So uh, we have a lot of people that are signed up for the advanced camps that move themselves through that process. Um, and then obviously, uh, you know, they get to their teams and coaches take care of that. Um, Chris, I do have a, I, I do sort of have a question, a follow-up to Daniel, if I may. Sure. Um, Daniel, I'm curious, you know, we're talking about how you train through COVID uh, famously, you know, you're talking about starting uh, an NBA season perhaps before Christmas, which of course for the Olympics, that's great news. Uh, but now, you, you know, you're having to do maybe less games. And I think there's been a philosophical uh, debate going on within NBA teams with the length of a, an NBA season normally. Coaches are resting their players during games – at times, and that's that's sort of made it to the news. What do the Wizards do? What do you do with a lengthy season to keep your players from being overtaxed and perhaps more susceptible to injury? Do, do you have a stance on that? Yeah, it, it's a really good question. It's a it's a really hot topic. All this is so called load management, and particularly during during COVID times. Uh, and to be honest, it's just spot right on. Like when we went into the bubble, our biggest concern, as Sitapa mentioned in Spain, it was not only COVID. Uh, to you know, to some degree, with all the setup that we had, we 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 understood that COVID will not be an issue, but injuries will become right. Uh, the fact that we go into more um, uh, condensed schedule as NBA, I think, you know, having had the chance of being in um, European soccer for so long and, um, and getting in contact through Barca, through different sports as well. I think NBA is a different animal when it comes to, to calendar. It's so taxing having three or four games 
a week for uh, for so long, the back to backs, and um, and something that as a foreigner is hard to understand and realize how big the United States are in terms of traveling, right? So that those all uh, miles that you put on on also they count. So to your question in terms of how we handle, uh, it's a, there is a lot that is being said on on uh, on the on the management of players. Most of them, I think, is being uh, mis uh, understood or misled uh, to the public opinion. There is not a magic recipe. There is not a magic number or um, biotech that nowadays will tell you this guy is going to get injured. This is the precise um, dose or amount or minutes that they can do. Um, in my experience, you know, there's some actions that you can take, some um, monitoring that we do using using technology. But basically what they do is they just support or inform better decisions from our experts, which, has, which are our coaches and, and sports scientists and trainers. So basically it all comes down, Carol, to, to communication uh, as, many, as many things in, in life. If you, if you go, I'm from a strictly scientist, scientific perspective, um, you know, you review all the biomarkers, you review all the load and, and you put them against just a simple question. It's like, are you tired? They probably correlate as much. So like, it's, it's kind of a, if you want to know someone is tired, if the player is tired, just ask them, right? You don't need this fancy uh, development that we do, that we do, don't get me wrong. We do follow them, but the piece of, you know, understanding the player, the circumstances, there is, there is many components that you cannot capture. Uh, um, and, and that's pretty much how, how we do it. Uh, we do have for the veteran players, different objective. We have much more data and knowledge of what they can achieve and how, you know, and you kind of rely them in a little bit more um, firmly in terms of, you know, they know their body, they know their timing. They, you know, you can, you can, if you build that relationship, you can really get into good decision-making. With the developing players, we try to be careful and build them up for, a, for their uh, long career. So I would say I like to look at it um, as more of a, not, not a management, load management, but a kind of a career preservation where you allow young players to grow and the older, uh, older players to, to continue to perform. Uh, COVID has not changed that much. And I'm, you know, at this point, I get to acknowledge that I'm not sure if it's been somehow beneficial, you know, for some players to have some downtime where they, they've been able to work on their own and, you know, just do some lifting and take care of their body and build on previously, since there is nothing else to do, literally, particularly before the bubble, they just, they just were allowed to go into the weight room and go onto the core and do the one-on-one -on -one practices that led into probably a better quality built up for them. Aside, we need to take the mental health perspective that we've been pretty strong. We built a pretty solid mental health program during the, during the lockout. Um, here we had a, a two or three times contact with our mental health team um, led by Derek Anderson. Um, and we basically just throw them like two or three times a week uh, mental health pills that will provide them with topics to think or discuss and open discussion in that sense. So that's pretty much how we how we handle it. And um, and we go, you know, it's, it's hard to predict the future in general. So imagine how difficult it is to uh, to predict a multifactorial uh, aspect like like injury or performance that is really, really noisy by, by nature. So that's that's pretty much how we do it. Great. Thank you. So Leah Bartula's got a question for everyone. Assuming that the games will continue in bubbles, which matches do you look forward to next season? Which teams in your leagues or internationally should we look out for? Uh, Sitab, I'll start with you. <laughs> well, internationally, they're probably not going to go to the bubble route for some of the, the reasons I, I, I mentioned. But uh, definitely at the, I would say at the international level, uh, people are looking forward to those uh, FIBA windows where the national teams uh, have to obviously compete to try to make it to, uh, to the Olympics. And it'll, it'll be quite different from what we're used to because again, the NBA players will not be allowed to participate. So when it comes to, to Europe, it shifts a lot, the balance of, of power between teams and you know, gives for a lot, of, a lot of nice surprises and upsets, which is always fun in sports. Anybody else? Uh, who do you, th do you see anybody 
Carol, that's a, a threat to this amazing uh, winning run that you've been on? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you don't want to look back. You know, you always want to daily, and I think this is something that our coaches do really well. Every day we want to get better. So um, you, you don't necessarily, it's like running a race. You know you've got them when they're starting to look around and see how close the next runner is behind you. Nevertheless, Australia is always good. Uh, Spain is always good. France is always good. You know, there's, there's the classic group that is always good. Um, and we'll be ready. Uh, the men, uh, you know, Spain won the most recent uh, World Cup. So our men, uh, you know, they'll be ready as well. But I, I, I'd like to do a quick uh, uh, advertisement for a couple of, of international events that are about to happen. Right. Uh, 3X3 is going to be in the Olympics for the first time. And there's a ranking system that has identified some of the teams that will be already participating in the Olympics. Both of our teams are not ranked high enough, but we will be participating in Olympic qualification tournament that will be in Graz, Austria, uh, the end of May. And if we can end up top three in those two qualifying tournaments, we then will go to the Olympics with our team. The thing that's great about 3x3, it's a 10-minute game. There's only four players. Uh, you know, it, momentum is huge. It can shift. So it's more, really, really exciting. It doesn't necessarily include the NBA level player, but it, is, it has its, its very dedicated uh, followers and players that will be playing. So that's something to look out for. The other thing is for the actual 5x5 teams that are going to the Olympics, on the women's side, we know who the 12 teams are. That's been set. But the men have another interesting qualification process. Our USA team and Argentina are the two America's teams that will be going. But there are four spots open, and there will be four Olympic qualifying tournaments the end of June through July 4th that will be played around the world. And the winner of those tournaments will go to the Olympics. So the fight for that final qualification spot is gonna be very, very big. Canada is hosting one of the events. Um, they haven't qualified yet. And obviously if you host event, you try to give yourself the best uh, possibility of qualifying, but there will be four of those tournaments going on with those four final games on July 4th that will be very, very important internationally. So I would, uh, you know, if you're really a, a basketball lover, those are the uh, qualification tournaments I would keep an eye on. Got it. So what gives you, and I'm gonna throw this out to, to all three of you, what gives you the level of the most optimism going forward? And what is your greatest concern going forward? Um, Danielle? Um, I would say, you know, the biggest confidence I've seen is, and, uh, and I'm going back to the, to the NBA example. I think that, um, I think we need to be, uh, somehow objective and understand that science nowadays can, can really position us in a, in a, in a way of making good decisions. I think, you know, my, one of my takeaways of all this situation is how important leadership is for, uh, in, in, in COVID times and at, and that multi-scale, I mean, from a club, from a federation, from a nation, uh, leadership really dictates what you, what direction we take and, and, and we see that. So I'm positive, I think, I think more and more uh, globally will come in together and understanding the situation as Sitapa referred in, in Europe, like more and more we understand that, you know, it doesn't matter if Germany or France lock down, if you don't do the same or have some coordination with Spain or Portugal or the Canary Islands, for instance, that are just way, way far down, right? So I'm optimistic in that. I, I, I see signs of, uh, of change and, and understanding of the situation much better from a strictly uh, scientific and, and medical perspective. I also, socially, I think we've, we've come to an understanding the hard way, as many times happens to us as humans, that, uh, that uh, there are few things that are simple to do that we can do that will lead us to, to a safer place. So I see that more, more and more in, in, our, in our surrounding and my day-to-day -day reality. And I feel 
that that's a that's a positive I will as well, and I think we all realize how fragile the situation can be. So that uh, that really makes me feel positive about the future in general. The biggest threat again is um, it's uh, it's one of the main things that, in my opinion, and as, as many do, COVID has exposed, which is the the fra fragility of the societies that that we have built and how some um, areas of our society, some people are being really uh, affected by COVID. And, um, and, you know, on the return side, how powerful the sports are delivering the messaging. We just saw a um, few weeks ago, and going back to the soccer example, one of the biggest games that you can watch in football nowadays in soccer is Barca Madrid. Um, the game is started, and it's a game that is expected to have somewhere between three 350, 400 million people watching that game, the game started giving advice on how to handle a COVID situation. So I think sports is a great platform. Historically, it has been um, to deliver messages. So that, you know, those, those three pillars, the one of uh, leadership science, uh, the one of, you know, economic balance and the messaging through sports, I think they all come together and makes me feel good about what we do and, you know, get up and and like I said, hoping to get the league up and running, the sooner the better to, to kind of get in, in all, all of our fans to, to move in the right direction. Great. Sitafa, how about you? Well, in a, I think it's clear that in times of crisis, uh, there's always huge potential for, for innovation. And we've seen uh, sports, the sports industry showing a lot of resilience to survive this period of time. So I think a lot of the lessons learn during this period of time will be of use once we get past uh, the, the, the toughest moments of the, of the crisis. We've seen how leagues have worked on and are developing new ways to engage uh, the, the spectators to maintain this connection when you can't have them physically there. This, when you can finally have people back, is not something to be put back in the shoebox and left on the side. It should be added to the prior uh, way and model of working to really you know, further enhance uh, the, the, the reach of sports. Also, it's clear, as I mentioned before, when we talk about preventive health, the importance of sports. And professional sports is, in a way, the, the storefront. You know, it's a great way, as Danielle just uh, mentioned before, to, to motivate uh, youth and society in general. It's a great platform to talk to society in general. So I think it, that makes it obvious uh, that it's a need for all governments and I think nobody will forget sports and the sports industry when it comes down to helping them along to survive this tough period of time and go forward. Got it. Carol, how about you? Well, I, I'm a, a big fan of, of team sports, and I think teamwork is the key to advancing societies and, and the world. I don't think anybody can work in, in a silo. I think the, the fact that uh, you can come to a common goal and work hard together uh, to achieve whatever that is, is really the lessons of, for sure, team sports. And I think individual sports have their own team set up as well. So teamwork to me is, is what gives me hope that I think we can work together to do this, um, especially in moments of crisis. Uh, I think the thing that, that causes me concern uh, obviously, always, but especially in this kind of a crisis, uh, is the in uh, uh, Satafa said it the economics uh, that are that are at risk. And I, I think, you know, you can find the money for your prioritized best goal, but it's the other things that you're kind of losing. Uh, you look around sports in this country, and a lot of of the Olympic quote unquote sports are being cut. Uh, and they're trying to figure out how can they exist. I look at the Americas, you know, the United States is unique in that we are sponsor driven in terms of our economics uh, at USA Basketball, but other countries rely on their ministries of sport, their national Olympic committees. And if they're not, um, if they're not successful, many times their governments won't fund them. And, and in a time of crisis, the governments may just not have enough money to fund them. So everything gets a little bit at risk. I think coming from a women's sports perspective, 
you know, there's a little concern. I know that FIFA has started to support women's soccer a little bit more as well, and that maybe they're going to pull back funding. So I, I just think it's it's the 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 down ballot kinds of sports, if, to use a current term, that may be at risk. And and I hope that that doesn't continue. I hope we beat this thing uh, soon. Thanks. Well, I know that with your Olympic team, with your commitment to have five Notre Dame players, let's say Skylar, <laughs> uh, Jackie, uh, Jewel, uh, Kit. No, I'm just kidding. But I know you'll have some some of the wonderful Notre Dame graduates here who have done well in the WNBA looking to try to get on that team. Well, and let me give Notre Dame a shout out on that. Ruth Riley was uh, the first Olympian to come from Notre Dame. I'm sure there will be many more. Uh, uh, Muffet has done a great job. Niel has got a lot of big shoes to fill there, but I, I think she'll do a great job as well. So congratulations to Notre Dame on all of your sports. Yeah, and I just also want to give another shout out to Ruth Riley, who's been so active in um, fighting, helping fight malaria with the Nothing But Nets program, which is also sponsored by the NBA and WNBA. And uh, she's just more than a great basketball player and an announcer. She's a great person. So thank you. So uh, thank you. Wow. I want to offer some warm thanks to our guests, uh, Danielle, uh, Sitafa, Carol. It's It's been enlightening for me. I, I know that's it's been great. So thank you for taking the time and, and thank all of you for joining us. This was the last of our three-part series on where we're going in sports. And uh, next week, we'll turn our college uh, campus colleagues to pivot the discussion to privacy. So this three-part series will be moderated, uh, moderated by Mark Mac McKenna, who is a law school professor who also is the faculty director of Technology Ethics Center here at Notre Dame. So please feel free to share this series with your friends. Uh, we're accepting registrations throughout the entire program as each meeting can stand on its own. So please join us again next Thursday at 1 p.m. as we continue the conversation to privacy. And once again, thank you very much for your time, for your efforts, and please, everybody, stay safe out there. And uh, Carol, Danielle, Satafa, thank you. God bless you all.